This is the big temptation today. Okay, but nonetheless, so now we have this gap between what I am in myself, in my reality, and my symbolic identity. And uh, I claim that for Hegel, now first I want to do my usual crazy thing, mm -hmm. defend Hegelian notion or deduction of the king, of monarchy. It's much more crazy than you think. For Hegel, the definition of a king is precisely, it's a very tragic position in a way. It's a subject who accepts this radical decenterment. The Hegelian king knows totally, I am nothing. I'm just a function of what people think that I am. The only reality that matters is my penis. My duty is to bring, uh, to produce, uh, to produce uh, next kings and, as Hegel says it openly, the duty of the king is to sign documents. He doesn't have to know what he is signing. This is decided by ministers who know, and so on, and so on. So, uh, what does this decenterment mean that has to be accepted as a king? Uh, which, again, is the exact opposite of the king who believes that he is a king. You know, that Jacques Lacan has this wonderful statement that uh, a madman is not only a beggar who thinks he is a king. A madman is only the king who thinks he is a king. That is to say, a king who really thinks that in himself he is what people take him to be. Maybe you know it, maybe not, I love it. There is a wonderful anecdote. Uh, 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 about what happened during the big battle between the Prussian and the Austrian army in 1866, I think, Prussian-Austrian war, when uh, the Prussian king, formerly the supreme commander of the army, was observing the battle from a nearby hill. He looked worried at what appeared to him the confusion of the front, where, you know, to him, it looked the confusion. Some Prussian troops were even retreating, so he was very worried. Then, the famous General von Moltke, the famous strategist who planned the battle, at a certain point when King was still worried, totally confused, turned to the King and told him, may I be the first to congratulate your majesty for a brilliant victory. <laughs> this is what I like. The, the idea that the king who was the master, the total commander, was totally ignorant of what goes on. Already everything was controlled by Moltke. Nonetheless, formally, the king was the boss. So he congratulated the king. And I think that this is what Hegel was deeply aware of. And I think it's Hegel's Christian moment at his best, especially actual today where, I don't know if you noticed it, but we are slowly stepping out of democracy into expert rule, literally. Did you notice the strange thing that happened in Greece recently? The prime minister proposed a referendum. All Europe was in a total panic. My God, ask the people horror. <laughs> then the Greeks decided just to nominate totally non-legitimized, a pure technocratic expert government, oh, big relief in Europe, and so on, and so on. And it's not just Greece. In Italy, it happened the same, and so on, and so on. He what Hegel knew is that uh, uh, the greatest threat is when experts, those who are directly legitimized by their knowledge, abilities, take power. That this is the formula of totalitarianism. The paradox of Hegelian start der Vernunft, rational state, is that you must have an ignorant idiot on the top who decides. You can have experts, but they only give counsels, proposals, the decision itself that the gesture, yes, no, this is now the law, this is not the law, must not be made by experts. Here, I think, I don't have time to go into it, Marx totally missed the point in his 
early critique of Hegel's Rechtsphilosophy, where he makes all the fun of Hegel and so on. And history had a great revenge on Marxism here. Because in Stalinism, we precisely got a master, a leader, who thought that he knows, really. Stalin was not just like a king. Stalin was not just a symbolic top. The whole machinery was to demonstrate that he really knows. And then you get the nightmare that we got. It's the same with, uh, it's the same also with, for example, among other things, with Kafkaesque bureaucracy. People do not often notice that this abyss horror of Kafka's universe is not because we have some higher authority there which is purely irrational. No, it's bureaucracy. The definition of Kafka's universe is bureaucracy without a king, which then runs crazy. The formula of totalitarianism is not an arbitrary leader. No, it's experts take power. And you can even find this at the literal level. Like, did you notice that, for example, Stalin's origins are not the leader? He was the biggest mistake of his life, probably hired by, hired, as it were, by Lenin as, you know, in 22, I think, or 21, Lenin said, oh my God, we have so many things to decide in Politburo. We need someone just to take notes and put things in order. So, because Stalin was at that time considered a kind of a local idiot of the Politburo, first Lenin proposed it to Trotsky. Trotsky said, no, it's too humiliating. I do not <laughs> So, Stalin said, no, they say, okay, I will do it. And then, you know, two years later, Trotsky, Trotsky was a little bit stupid there, if you read history, because Trotsky believed in himself. He thought, who cares about this small bureaucrat? I will make one big speech and Stalin will be out. Well, he noted, you know, Trotsky was really, it's tragic. In the, from 23 to 25 seats, Trotsky was like, you know, that famous scene from Zeichentrick film, cartoons, where a cat walks above the precipice and falls down only when it notices that, no? Trotsky was already walking up in the air. He was totally without power, but he didn't know it. Then in 26, I think, he was reminded by Stalin, hey, look down, there is now. And he went all of a sudden. Uh, so again, uh, 